Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Brunsfield Evangelical Church. My name is Alistair. I have the privilege of being the assistant pastor here, and this morning it is my joy to lead us through the service. This morning we are going to sing songs. We are going to pray to our great God. We are going to hear from the a reading of his word, and then Graham Shanks, our pastor, is going to preach to us later on in the service. Maybe this is your first time in church. Maybe this is your first time here at Brunsfield. Or maybe you've been here for many, many times and many years. Let me just begin with a few words to help us remember why we're here. From Psalm 147. Psalm 147 says this. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God with harp. I don't know exactly the kind of week you guys are all coming from. Maybe you've had a phenomenal week and you are rejoicing as you come through the doors. Or maybe you're one of those people in this psalm who says that they are brokenhearted, that they have wounds that need binding up. Well, this morning we come before a great and all-powerful God who cares for his people, who loves us and who calls us to come and praise him. So let us spend a moment in silence as we pray to our God before we move on in our service. Let's pray together. Our great God, we come before you this morning, the almighty, the all-powerful one, and we ask that you would strengthen us. Father, for those of us who are hurting, would you bring comfort? For those of us who are rejoicing, would you help us concentrate on you? Father, as we gather this morning, would you take away all of our fears, all of our troubles, and help us come before you, recognizing who you are, the great God of this world, and come in humble worship of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is for his glory that we pray. Amen. Gary and the band are now going to lead us as we sing two songs together describing how awesome our God is and who exactly our Savior Jesus Christ is. So let us stand together as the band lead us.
leopard nails upon his hands, bearing all the guilt of sinful man. God eternal, humble to the grave, Jesus Savior, risen now to Okay. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter. For anyone who doesn't know, I'm the youth pastor here, and I'd like to invite the kids up to the front here. We're going to play a game, okay? We're doing something that's a little bit more involved than we've done for quite a while uh, for a kid's talk, but we'll give it a go. We're going to see how it goes. Okay. So we're going to need we're going to need two teams, okay? So if we can split, let's say one, two, three. Okay, so Beth, if we don't include you, you'll be helping me. So uh, if we can split here, okay? So Andreas, if you guys can all go over there, down to this pew. Okay, so you four are gonna be a team, okay? Hello? You four are gonna be a team, right? Okay, and you guys four are gonna be a team. Beth's gonna be a helper. And uh, Elio, you gonna join in, yeah? Okay, so you can join this team then as well, unless somebody else joins this later on. Right, so let me explain. You're going to have a choice of what to do. Whenever I say go, you're going to get 20 seconds, and, okay, you've got 20 seconds, and either you can uh, stack cups, okay, so you can't stack them like this, but you can stack them in any other way you want to see how high your team can stack the cups, or... You can run to the foyer, and if you turn around and look, Rebecca's got some tokens, and you can collect one token and bring that up, okay? So you're gonna have to make a choice. Decide, are you gonna stack cups, or are you gonna run and get a token and bring it back? But you're not gonna have 20 seconds each, and then it'll be the next person in your team, they'll get 20 seconds, okay? Do you understand what we're doing? Yeah? yeah? Who's going first then? Who's going to go first? Yeah? Who's going first in this team? You're going to go first, right? Okay. So I'm going to give you 20 seconds. Okay, have you decided what you're going to do? Okay, you better decide, because I'm going to say go in just a wee minute, and you're going to have to decide. Are you going to go run for a token, or are you going to start stacking up the cups? Okay, on your marks, get set, go. Okay, they've both decided to go for a token. Right, you think you've got time to go and get another token? Probably not, no. If you'd gone straight away, you might have. Right, no, your time's up. Right, next person, next person, what are you gonna do? You gonna go get a token, or are you gonna stack some cups? Who's going to go next? Right, you ready? On your marks, cassette, go. Wow, nobody wants to stack the cups. <laughs> Fair enough. Nobody wants to stack cups. I just keep going okay, that's 10 seconds up. 15, 16, 17. Uh, I'll let you away with it. I think you were really over time there, but we'll let you away with it. Okay, who's going third? Who's the third person? Third person in this team? Okay, you ready? Okay, on your mark, set, go. 20 seconds. Keep going. Okay, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Oh, you got back. Okay, well done, right? That's your 20 seconds up. Next person. You, go, you ready? Who's next on this team? Yeah? You ready to go? On your marks, get set, go! Okay. Did you get a token? You did. Where is the token? Did we get it? Have another go. Go get a token. There we go. Well done, you got a token. Okay, good, excellent, right, that's, right, have we got one more person to go? Has everyone had a shot? You don't want a shot, no, okay. No, that's okay, if everyone that wants a shot has had a shot, then that's fine, okay? It's time to count up the points, okay? So you guys didn't stack any cups, so you didn't get any points for the cups, right? You guys didn't get any points for the cups. You guys got high, how many high? One, two, three, four. 
So you've got four points for the cups, okay? So, so far, this team is in the lead. You guys have got zero, you guys have got four points. Okay, how many tokens? Can you give me your tokens or count up your tokens? Can you count up your tokens? Six, Six tokens. Okay, so how many tokens have you got? Four. Okay, so you guys have got four points already and four tokens. These had no points and six tokens. So who do you think's won? Okay, well, what I didn't tell you at the start was that each token was worth 100 points. Okay, and the cups, each level of cups were only worth one point. Okay, so how would that have changed? If you'd known that at the start, how would that have changed? I think, were you the only one that did the? The one that did the cups, do you want to come up? If you had known that the tokens were worth 100 points and the cups were only worth one point, would you have done anything differently? Yes. What would you have done? I'd have got tokens. You would have gone for the tokens. You would have ignored the cups. You wouldn't have bothered with the cups. It was a waste of time. Whoops. I did knock down your cups, sorry. Okay, that was a waste of time compared to collecting the tokens because that was worth 100 points. Now, why are we thinking about that today? Well, it's because in the story today, we're, we're learning more about Jesus. We're in the book of Mark, and we're learning more about Jesus. And you see, Jesus, he had a choice. There were lots of things he could have been doing, but there was only one thing that was really important. Okay, so like for you guys, the cups were a distraction. The important thing was to go and get the tokens. For Jesus, there were lots of things that could have distracted him, but there was one thing that was really important, and that was teaching people, telling them the good news. Okay, so when we go upstairs later on, we're going to find out what was this distraction, what was the thing that distracted Jesus, or could have distracted Jesus, and how did he keep his focus and do the right thing? Okay, so a little bit different again, what's going to happen now. So during the next song, Crash and Roots are free to go to room three with Amy and Rebecca. We are going to stay a little bit longer than normal, okay? Because I think there, there's an interesting bit uh, about evangelism, about what the church is really keen to do that I think would be good for you guys to hear. Um, and then we'll go up during the second song, or we'll go upstairs during the second song, and then the embassy, so the secondary school kids, they're going to stay in the service, and they'll meet afterwards uh, in room one with Danny and Abby, okay? So we're going to stay a little bit longer. We'll see how that goes. You can let me know uh, what you think about that. But before we do that, let's, let's pray. Okay, P-R-A-Y. Dear God, thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for all the uh, boys and girls, all the young people that are here today. And I pray that you'd help us this morning not to be distracted by things that are not that important. Help us to keep our focus on you, Lord. And we thank you that Jesus was totally focused on what was really important. He was focused on his mission to tell people the good news and he wasn't distracted by other things. Um, and Lord, you pray you'd help us in kids' church and at Roots and at the embassy later on uh, and everyone learning, listening to the sermon as well. Help us to, to focus and not be distracted and to learn more about you and your wonderful son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Okay, so let's take a seat just now. Beth, can you give me a hand? Well, folks, just a few things to draw to your attention by way of notices this morning. Just to say that this evening, again, we have an opportunity to gather together and uh, have our evening service at 6.30. It would be great if you could join us. Archie, our pastor in training, will be taking our next installment of the This Is Our God series, focusing on God as being triune and how that should affect our lives. So this evening at 6.30 and at that service, there'll be a time for us to take communion together as well with an open time of prayer together at that service. So please do come along at 6.30 this evening. It would be great to see you. And then tomorrow evening, we have an opportunity to pray together as a church again at 8 p.m. on Zoom. That's just 30 minutes where we're on Zoom and we can 
chat to each other, we can pray for one another, pray for the things going on in our world and encourage one another. So please do come along to that. The details for it are in the newsletter. If you aren't getting the newsletter, let me know. I'll be standing at the door afterwards and I can get those details to you. And then the last thing to say is that this week is our small group week. So at the beginning of a new term, we haven't met a small group since December. So what we're going to do, instead of having a study straight away, we're going to have a social together. So this week, do get in touch with your small group leader. They'll tell you when and where that's happening. And uh, just an opportunity to build our relationships with one another before kicking off with Bible studies the next time we meet. So small groups this week. And before we continue with the rest of our service, let us turn to our great God and pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and remembering the words of Psalm 147, we recognize you as the great God, the one who is mighty in power, the one who sustains the humble, the one who flung the stars into space, the one who knows every star by name, and yet the one who stoops and heals the brokenhearted, who binds the wounds of those who are hurting. Father, you are so wonderful to us. We thank you so much for your goodness. And yet, Father, we confess that every day we wrong you. And in a moment of silence now, we bring our confessions before you. Father, we thank you for the wonderful promise in Scripture that we can hold fast to, that for all those who come to you, who repent of their sins, who put their trust in the name of Jesus, their sins are forgiven. No one can outsin your grace. No one can outsin the forgiveness that Christ has given to us. And yet, Father, we still live in this broken world, and so often we don't know what to pray. As we look at our news screens and we see everything going on in Ukraine, everything going on in Yemen, and all the political issues that are at play. Father, for those in power in these places, would you give them wisdom? Would you bring reason? Father, for those people in Yemen who are at the brink of starving, would you help the aid get to them as they need it? Father, would you sustain them? And Lord, would you help your people in these countries to be a beacon of light? to both hold out the hope of the gospel that is only found in Jesus, that true and lasting hope, but also to bring the practical need that the people have. And Father, closer to home, we pray for our own country as well. We ask that you would give our leaders wisdom as they seek to govern. Would they do so with wisdom? Would they do so in a way that honors you? Father, be with Christian politicians. Would they be witnesses of you in their workplace? Would they point our leaders to the hope of Jesus? And would we be able to rejoice that people have come to know you through their witness? Father, we turn our eyes to our own church and we give you thanks for the Thanksgiving service of Archie Naismith yesterday. Thank you for his life and the way he lived. Thank you for the witness and encouragement he was to so many people. And Father, we thank you that it was a day saturated with your name and that you were given all the glory. Father, continue to be with the Naismith family as they mourn and as they rejoice that he is now at peace with his Savior. And Father, as a church family, would you help us to remember him, to speak well of him and to share memories, but also to, to be like him and to point people to Jesus like he did. Father, for those of us in this room, those of us watching at home maybe, you know where our hearts are. You maybe see how comfortable it is for us to sit at home and watch watch church on the screen rather than gather with our brothers and sisters. Father, you know how much we hurt and the pains we have in our lives. Father, would you bring comfort? 
by your spirit, would you teach us and would you point us to Jesus? Father, as we go into the rest of this service, we ask that your name would be lifted above every other name, that everything that is said and done here would be for the upbuilding of your kingdom, and that as we turn shortly to your word, that you would give us soft hearts, that you would give us open ears, that we would hear your word and that we would submit to it, and that we would be, leave this room as better Christians, better disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. For his glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, we're going to now stand and sing a song that helps us focus on Jesus and who he is, what he did on the cross, and the future glory that awaits us. So let's stand and sing together, oh, praise the name. And during this song, the crash and roots can leave. For
Well, thank you so much, Gary and Band. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Graham. I'm the pastor here. What we love to do once a month is highlight and spotlight the work and the people involved in one of our ministry teams, uh, this group of people who we've tasked uh, with the, the job of driving forward a particular area of church life. This morning, we're going to hear from our evangelism team some of the ideas. The evangelism team, not to do the evangelism of the church, but the evangelism team who are here to equip us to do the work of witnessing for Jesus, the, the, the kind of uh, vision we go for, all of us witnessing for Christ, wherever we are, um, whatever it is we're doing, and whoever it is that comes across our path, being witnesses for Jesus across this city. So we're going to hear from Stuart. Stuart's part of the evangelism team. Stuart could not be better placed to come up there. I love that you sat just there, brother. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Stuart's just part of the, the evangelism team. He's going to just tell us a little bit about uh, some of the exciting plans that we have for this year. So, Stuart, tell us why you're passionate about evangelism. Uh, so, I guess the big thing for me is evangelism is seeing lives changed. Uh, so, in my own life uh, as a Christian, what began it all was I got invited to a curry night. And then from that, I met a really godly group of Christians who just poured God's love into me. And I realized the depth of my sin and how much I needed Jesus. And that's what changed my whole life, which was a simple invitation to dinner. Um, so it's, it's having that same kind of mindset when it comes to telling other people about Jesus, because let's face it, it can be scary, especially if you have like a negative reaction. You know, you have people that are just don't want to know about Jesus. But imagine how that changes when God's just working out their heart, just chipping away at that block of ice until he changes it from a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. You know, I've had... A, a wonderful friend of mine was actually a prostitute where, when I knew her. I, I didn't know this at the time, but I found this out later. But um, we reached out to her, and she, again, through food. And her life changed because she met Jesus. And that's what we want to kind of look forward to as a church is seeing more lives changed. You know, imagine the city of Edinburgh full of Christians who believe in God. Imagine that the, the city absolutely changed and transformed by what Jesus has done and how different that would be you know, as a city, as a country, you know, it's, God is great and, and so glorious and wonderful and more people need to hear about him because those who don't know Jesus, sadly, they're consigned to death and hell and that's a horrible thing to, for people we love to, to go through, you know, I think Charles Spurgeon once said, if, if, if people want to walk into the, the depths of hell, though, they must do so over our bodies, like, we should be trying with all that we can to Share them, share with them who Jesus is. Share that salvation, that wonderful power and love that God has for them as his children. Yeah. Just to give you a small idea. No, I, incredible. Thank you so much, brother. For We just we get your heart in that. That's, that's wonderful to hear. Just maybe tell us how we're going to try and do this as a church this year. Okay, so practically, I'm going to talk about two things. So uh, the first thing is we have a three-pronged approach um, to think about it. So kind of areas where we can... Think about evangelism in the everyday uh, a little bit easier because it's easy to think of something like an alpha course or a life explored and go, oh, that's evangelism. But then we can kind of go, oh, just talking to my friend about Jesus maybe isn't. Or we have it in our mind that, okay, evangelism can only be done by the evangelism team. Don't think that. That's, that's not, <laughs> not right at all. So yes, some people may be more gifted in evangelism, but it is a calling for all Christians to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It's something for all of us uh, to do it. And so uh, we want to think about that in three ways. So we want to think about how we can care and serve for people in our local community. So whether that might be, well, we have the basics bank already in Edinburgh, but maybe there's other ways that we can do things. Maybe you have someone who's like an older person living on their own, needs some help. You can go around and just share that love of God with them by serving them and witnessing to them. Uh, we also want to think about the go and tell. So think about where your friends and the people you know are up to. Like, because for a lot of people that don't believe in, in God, they wouldn't really want to step into a church. So go and meet them where they're at. You know, do you have friends that maybe after work on a, on a Friday or something go to the pub? Um, you could go with them and just share life with them and just show them that you're not some kind of weirdo that, because <laughs> often non-Christians seem to think that Christians are. Or it could even be, okay, I've got this, uh, like, sports team that I'm involved in, maybe like hockey or football. Um, and I really love to see those, those people uh, know Jesus. So why don't I go along and just, just say a little bit, like, each time, you know. Or we go, we've won, and I go, oh, thanks, Jesus, for all that. Um, and then finally, we want to think about <laughs> come and see. So what are the things that we can invite people into 
uh, to do so. So whether that's stuff like courses at church or whether that's inviting them around to our homes for dinner to just share life and share Jesus with them through that. Um, and then secondly, the other thing we want, we're going to do, and we're planning to launch this next month, is we're going to have little business cards available with these three categories on there and space for you to write a person's name. And what we want you to do is to write down a person's name and pray for them. Just have this reminder with you. You know, you can fit it in a wallet, you can fit it like blue tack it to a wall or just somewhere you'll see it and think about them and pray for them. And as part of that, we're going to have on the back any events that are running that are of that theme. So if we're doing something like a course at church, the details will be there so you can invite people too. And there's also going to be a little QR code to a great resource uh, called like Short Answers to uh, kind of deeper questions. Uh, so if your friend comes up to you and goes, oh, well, if God's so good, then why is there so much suffering in the world? You can be like, I've got a great answer for you. Let me, you know, scan the QR code, look at the video, really think about it, see what the Bible says, and then go back to your friend and go, you know what, here's, here's what we believe as Christians. And it's just having these reminders to make evangelism every day and a thing that isn't scary to do, um, that it's not only certain people can do it, but it's something that all of you can do. You can all have a conversation with your friends. You can all have a cup of tea with someone and go, I just want to tell you about what I did on this weekend. I want to tell you about how and what, like, what church means to me. That kind of thing. That's what we're thinking about. It's brilliant. Stuart, love it, bro. Um, all of us witnessing for Christ, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whoever comes across our path, that's the vision. Um, lastly, you've kind of mentioned it there. Any other ways that we can get involved? Um, so we need help. Like That would always be good. Like More people to help with the, the team to facilitate evangelism happening and try and encourage people. Uh, in particular, we would uh, love to have a godly woman uh, of you like, join our team, because currently it's just a, uh, me, uh, uh, Graham and Derek. But um, yeah, you can help out in that way, or you can, when we come to run certain events, you could be a volunteer, come and serve, uh, come and help out. Um, you can also pray for each other. Like, maybe as part of your Sunday conversation that you have with someone, just go, oh, how's that person that you've been praying for? Like that person you want to know Jesus, like how are they doing? Like what's going on with that? Have you had any developments? Just ask, just talk to one another, just encourage each other. And one of the things that we would really love to do is we would love to share what's been happening in everyone's lives together as a church. Because like, was it last week you were talking about SU groups where just like the class doubled in size? Let's hear, like, hear something like that. Or even just, you know what, I had a good conversation with my atheistic colleague at work who really hates God, but we talked about the importance of, uh, of love and, and what that means. Like, let's share those encouragements as a church and build one another up. Yeah. Brilliant. Excellent. Love it, Stuart. Um, and let's do encourage our, our dear brother here in, in his heart for, for evangelism and get behind this. We're really excited about it. Um, also linked to this, there's something that uh, the churches in Edinburgh are getting together just before Easter to do something called a passion for life. Um, just up and down the nation, there's, there's churches getting together, uh, just taking evangelism seriously, a month of mission in preparation for a lifetime of evangelism. So we're involved with it at Brunsfield. Details will come in, in the next couple of weeks and months as to how we're involved in that and what's going on in the city. But let me just watch this short teaser video just to whet your appetite. Didn't know that went so loud at the end there. Apologies. <laughs> That's excellent. Hope that's got you excited, friends. We'll tell you more in the weeks and months to come. But we're going to stand again and sing about the glory of Jesus and what he's done for us. Uh, and Kids Church, uh, folks, this is your opportunity to go out. And then Abby's going to come up after the song and give us our reading for today. Christ on the road to 
morning, church family. Um, my name is Abby Bryant. I'm a member here at Brunsfield, and I'll be bringing you the reading from um, Haggai verses, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Um, it's found on page 948 in your pew Bible. So I'll give you just a couple seconds to flip there. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Sheatil, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Zo Josadak, the high priest, and to the remnants of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Now be strong, Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I have covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all of the nations, and what is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. This is the reading of God's word. May he bless it. Well, good morning, everyone. Let me encourage you to come expectantly to Haggai chapter 2. And let's just pray, shall we, just before we come to God's inspired word. Heavenly Father, we were thinking about last week in this book of Haggai, about what you do as your word goes forth. Thank you that your word does not return to you empty. Thank you that it is living and active. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. Father, thank you that you call your people to tremble before your word. And so, Father, we ask that you would transform us as a community as your voice is heard today. Lord, help us to respond rightly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Haggai chapter 2. It's a famous story told about Sir Christopher Wren. Uh, if you have no idea who Sir Christopher Wren is, if you're for generation, young generation, let me just uh, tell you who he is. You'll know what he's famous for. His famous work was the fact that he was the guy that designed St. Paul's Cathedral down in, in London. And there's a story told about Sir Christopher Wren, about how one day he decided when this building was being constructed, he decided to go undercover because he wanted to understand and see the heart of the people who were uh, building his vision. What was the mood like? So he goes undercover and he starts walking around the cathedral and he comes across three men. And he asks the three men the same question. He says, why is it that you're working? So he goes around the cathedral, number, uh, man number one, he says, tell me what you're doing. Why are you working? And the man looks up at him and says, I'm just carving a bit of stone, which is true, right? Just carving, chipping away, chiseling a bit of stone. Fine. So he keeps on walking, going through the cathedral. He comes across man number two. He says, why are you working? And he says, well, sir, I'm working for five shillings, two pence a day. Don't know what that's worth today, but it sounds all right for me. The guy's saying, I'm working to put bread on the table for my family to eat. Another brilliant reason to work. So he keeps on walking through the cathedral and he comes across man number three and he asks him the same question. He says, tell me, what is it you're doing? Why are you doing it? And of course, this man is doing exactly the same as the other two. He's got a family to feed. He's chiseling away at a bit of, a bit of stone. But this man looks up at Christopher Wren, looks him in the eye, not knowing who he is. And he says, why, sir, I'm helping to build Sir Christopher Wren's beautiful cathedral. So this man had seen the blueprints. He'd seen the drawings. But more than that, he'd bought into the bigger picture of what's going on, what's ahead. And there's a world of difference, isn't there, between fulfilling a task and understanding the bigger picture of why you're doing the task. And this morning is all about buying into God's big plan for the future. Big plan for the future. 
And it's so important that we know as followers of Jesus why we're doing what we're doing. What's the end game? Why are we doing this? Why do we meet on a Sunday? Why do we bother with evangelism? Why do we pray? Because I don't know whoever you are here today. Maybe you're a Christian. Maybe you're a non-Christian coming in thinking, what is this all about? And we all come here having watched the news this week and seen the things that have gone on. Okay, we've seen the devastation in Tonga. Or maybe you've read the stories this week about the two richest men in the world whose net worth has somehow doubled during lockdown while the rest of the world is struggling to make ends meet. Or maybe it's just like me this week. I, I filled in, I did my gas and electricity prices this week, did my meter readings, and I could not believe the sum that came back. Never seen a figure like that before in my life. All of these things, don't they, come at our hearts and cause us to ask the question, who's at the steering wheel? Who's in control? Is there a plan for where the world is going? And this passage today would tell us that history is going somewhere. It would tell us that God has a plan for his people's good. Now, the question we need to ask ourselves in the context of Haggai is why do these people at this time need to know that? And this is where we join the action. Come with me to verse 1 of chapter 2. And the chronology is really important here. So this is near two months after the prophet Haggai has begun to speak. So two months, get that figure in your head, two months. And it's nearly one month since the people started rebuilding the temple at the end of chapter one. So the maths is that they have been building this thing for nearly 30 days. Okay, and I remember uh, having some friends who were really into the gym. And they always used to say, we're never going in January. Never going in January, because you have to queue for the machines, you have to wait for a shower. We're not going in January, we're going in February. Do you mind we're going in February? Because all the people that came in January hoping that this was something they could do this year have given up, because it's quieter in February. And the enthusiasm of the people who came in January has totally dwindled. And we know that feeling, don't we, all of us? Just losing enthusiasm just feeling the reality of what's in front of us, of running out of steam. And that's what's going on on the streets of Jerusalem. The honeymoon period is over. The reality of the project has set in. The sheer size of the task of rebuilding the temple has got them down. And you've got to understand that the energy and enthusiasm levels that once were there in shed loads have completely dwindled. And they're just spiritually spent. And so if the issue, if you follow with me, if the issue in chapter one is apathy and God challenges that, the issue in chapter two is despondency and God encourages. They are weary, they are discouraged, they are disillusioned. They're discouraged. Now here's the thing, one of the last time, when the last time was that you walked into Waterstones? or Amazon, or something like that. You know how you walk into Waterstones, and you go in, and there's the table, and it just says bestsellers on it, right? The ones that are flying off the shelves that week, that month, the bestsellers. You ever wondered what makes a bestseller a bestseller? I reckon it's because it clicks with where people are at. Now, let me just, whoever you are here today, let me just tell you about a Christian bestseller. It was written by a man It was a book, rather, called Pilgrim's Progress, written by a man called John Bunyan way back in the day. And it remains a bestseller to this day. And it was this allegorical book that he wrote about the Christian life. Central character, a man called Christian, however he came up with that, I don't know. But he's he's journeying towards heaven. He's journeying towards heaven. And on the way to heaven, he's coming across all these different characters. And one of the characters he comes across is the giant of despair. The giant of despair who lives in Doubting Castle. So Christian, on the way to the promised land, on the way to heaven, encounters the giant of despair, and somehow he's ushered into the castle of doubt, Doubting Castle. And he becomes so overwhelmed by the size of the giant, it almost causes him to give up. And Christians over the years have bought that book because it clicks 
It's a bestseller because there's something in it. There's something that John Bunyan was saying all those years ago that we know to be true in our lives. That we become discouraged on the Christian journey. That the size of the task, the size of the giant becomes overwhelming. And this is how it's going to play out in our day-to-day lives. We know it, don't we? That relationship in your family that's wearing you down. That job that so many in our world are in and will be exactly the same. That job that seems dead end. You're at a career crossroads. You're wondering what life is going to look like after university. Applications, what's going to happen. There's a niggling health issue in your life that's not going away. You just keep getting it wrong with the kids. The sin that, that dominates your life repeatedly just keeps coming up. You don't feel like you're making any progress. That test result that came back that has leave, left you flat. There's all sorts of things in our lives as Christians that can cause us to doubt. And think, can I, should I, can I keep going? Can I keep going? And this is what we need to see here. God speaks to encourage. He spoke last week, a couple of weeks ago, to challenge. This week he speaks to encourage. And you've got to understand that the Lord here is the good doctor. There's a reason why Jesus is in the Gospels. Is the great physician. And here's what we need to do as we draw alongside these people in chapter two. I want us to be honest about two things that can cause us to give up what God's called us to do. Two things that will cause us to give up. And then I want us to be strengthened by three things that I think should cause us to keep going. Okay, and here's really simply what I want us to see. I want us to see that three is greater than two. Okay, three is greater than two. Because here is two things in the text, or sorry, two things in this passage that can cause us to give up. Okay, ready for these? Here's number one, the present feels messy. Present feels messy. And this is kind of what's going on behind the text. The people have been at this for nearly 30 days. You can, you know what that's like to be at something for a month, don't you? And remember, this is 520 BC. So this is not high cranes at the St. James's Quarter kind of gig. This is not civil engineers and world class architects coming together to join forces. This is just ordinary people. Ordinary people having a go at at doing what God's called them to do and build the temple. And and all the likelihood, all they've got to show for it so far is just they're looking at a pile of rubble. And this thing that God has told them to do looks seriously unimpressive compared to their panelled houses. Do you remember we met them in chapter one? Seriously unimpressive what they're looking at. And it's like that, isn't it, in the Christian life? It can feel messy. It can feel unimpressive all the time. All the time. Praying in your room, doing what God's called you to do. Right, we met last month upstairs hall. It was freezing up there. There was something like six or seven of us with the windows open. Thinking to myself, this looks so unimpressive. So unimpressive. That relationship as we walk with one another through life, that relationship that seems to not be going anywhere, that seems to be getting harder. Instead of, um, it's going to emotionally cost you to choose the road of saying sorry and, and being right with somebody Seeking reconciliation rather than choosing the easy road of just walking away. It feels unimpressive. I know many of you tomorrow are going to go to the fanciest offices. And you come in here and as as wonderful a building as this is, the truth is that the roof leaks and it's cold. You know, you can go on the internet and you can look at snazzy TED Talks complete with graphic design and you come in here on a Sunday And we try our best. We seek for Christ glorifying excellency. But I'm so aware in a world that looks slick and impressive that we come in here and we're devoting ourselves to listening to an ancient text. It can feel like the world is so much trendier. It can feel as we come in here. It can feel, isn't it? It can feel messy. It can feel unimpressive. But this is going to challenge us not to judge things by how we see them. It's, It's to judge them, keep on going and like, well, well, in light of what God has said is true about the future, but it's true, isn't it? That the, the present feels messy. That's where these people are at. The present feels messy. And number two, the past feels rosy. And this is what's specifically mentioned in the text. Look at verse three. 
God says, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Now, let me just point out there, isn't it wonderful that God asks questions, rhetorical questions? Yes, this is about submitting to the lordship of God, that he is lord over every area of his people's lives. But this lordship comes in the context of relationship. The Lord asks them questions. And you see, what's going on here is what the people are doing is that they're taking what they're seeing in front of them, the rubble, and many of them of a, a, probably an older generation who remember what the temple was like in Solomon's day, all those years before exile, are looking at it and thinking, this is nothing compared to what it was before. Nothing compared to what it was before. And the younger generation who are perhaps enthusiastic thinking, well, what's the point? What's the point? You know, like Uncle Albert from Only Fools and Horses, if you're in our generation, remember that, grew up on that show. What was his line? He always said, during the war, didn't he? During the war. Always loved telling a story about what it was like back in his day, how good he had it. And it's true, isn't it, friends, that nostalgia can get us down. It can get us down. Being pessimistic about the present, particularly when, it, when it's, it's coming from a place of we're, we're, we're rose-tinted spectacles about the past, particularly as things change. Okay, I, I hear it all the time as we look out at our country, and people say we used to be the land of the book, right? We used to have Billy Graham here. Celtic Park was packed. Revival was going on everywhere. And now look at us. And I'm not unsympathetic to that, that view. People say, John Knox, remember what he said? He said, give me Scotland or I die. That was his, his rallying call to his generation. And the thing is, if we want to recapture something of that, give me Scotland or I die, let's go for it. Absolutely, that spirit of revivalism that is expecting God to move in magnificent ways, that has a passion to take the news of Jesus out of our comfort zones to the suburbs of, and the schemes of our nation. If that's why we're quoting it, absolutely. But what so often happens is we quote it and we look out and we retreat. And what we end up doing is we end up casting judgmental stones at a culture that seems to be so different from the one that we're used to. And that cannot be God's heart for his people. To be so caught up in the past that we're failing to get involved in the present. Yes, I'm concerned about the state of our nation, but our God would say, I'm bigger than that. He has not ceased to be Lord over our nation. We saw about it last week. Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus is Lord over all things. That will never change. The present feels messy. And this generation, the past feels rosy. And those are two things, if we're really honest about it, that can cause us to give up. Remember what I said? Start three, it's greater than two. So God, I think, gives them three things to be strengthened by. Three reasons that they need to keep going. With this building project, remember we said it was so much bigger than a building. It was about their heart for the Lord, I mean, about who he is, and the, 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 the heart for his presence, wanting him. You see, verse four, God says, be strong, says the Lord. He, and if you're um, thinking of the wider Bible story, you'll recognize echoes of what God said to Joshua and his generation when they were thinking about can we take the promised land? Is God good for his word? And, and God would say to Joshua, no, be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged for the Lord, your God is with you. Echoes of that here. Do you see how God, verse four, he addresses Joshua, he addresses Zerubbabel, he addresses the people. You know, in sport, they always talk about a good man manager. Somebody, they always said this of Alex Ferguson, that he would go around a dressing room and he would know exactly the right thing to say to every individual player. Do you see how God here is the ultimate man manager? Knows what to say to the people. And it's almost as if he could, he would have gone around every single individual person and said, be strong, be strong, do not fear. Keep working, keep building. Why? Here's our three reasons. First two will be really quick, and the last one we'll think about it a little bit more. Number one, because the Lord is in your corner. 
He's in your corner. Do you see six times, if you've got the text there, six times in quick succession from verse four, God says, I am the Lord Almighty. It was in our second song, I think. Who can stop the Lord Almighty, right? So he is the God of angel armies. It's a warrior term. This is who this God is. He is the all-powerful God. He's the God who will not be thwarted in accomplishing the purposes that are in his heart for the good of his people. It's the Lord Almighty who's in your corner. And while it looks unimpressive here, you've got to understand that sitting above this is a God who reigns over all things. You know, I love the story. I've told it before, but I'm telling it again, okay? Love the story of the old Quaker Hall down in Birmingham sitting on a bit of prime real estate and there's something like a handful of members in this little Quaker hall. One day they receive a letter from John Lewis, big department store who are next door, offering to buy their land. The Quaker hall send one back saying, thanks, but no thanks. But while we've got you, we'd like to make an offer to buy your land. Yours sincerely, John Cadbury. Right, John Cadbury, the owner of the vast Cadbury's chocolate empire, and who was one of the handful of people in that Quaker hall. It matters that you know who's on your team. It matters who, know, who you know has got your back. And God is saying to the people here, it's the Lord Almighty who's in your corner. And here's reason number two, you keep going because the Lord is in your corner, yes, but the Lord is by your side. Verse five, do you see how God takes them on a history lesson? He says, I'm the same God who brought your forefathers out of Egypt all those years before. Sure, they would have heard about that in exile, but how God had, had come through from them in the past had made these glorious promises to his people about the future. He says, I'm the covenant God, L-O-R-D, the covenant God. Covenant, just meaning this binding commitment that God makes to his people. His promises to them that he will be their God. They will be his people. He knows where he's taking them. He will take them to the promised land. What's so special about the promised land? It's not just that it's a nice place. It's because God is there. He is with his people. And this shows us the determination of the God of the Bible to win and bring his people home to himself. He is with them. And then really quickly, number three, why keep going? The Lord is in our corner. The Lord is by our side. And here's number three, because the Lord has got our future. He's got our future. Verse six. And just look at how many times God says, I will there. Just stop and have a look at that. I didn't see it until Friday. He says, I will. I will. Do you see? I will. It's wedding language here. God is binding himself to his people. It's almost as saying, sorry, and do you see how the initiative is all of the Lord here? It's almost as if he's saying, stand back and see what I will do for you. Stake it all on me, knowing that I will come through for you. Now, here's what I want us to understand. This is about who the Lord is. This is not about these people. This is not about you and I bringing our spiritual A-game to the party. God is saying, if only you could reach the spiritual threshold, then I'll be able to do things. But if you don't, I can't. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, I will do this. I will do this. This is not about you and I getting our moral act together. This is about God being who God is. And what will God do for them? Two words. He will fill. See that, verse seven? God will fill. He will fill the temple with his glory. His people will, ex will experience and know his presence and his grandeur and his greatness in a superior way to anything that they've ever known before. Even greater, verse nine, than anything that their ancestors had ever experienced before. God will fill this temple with glory. God will be with them. And how will he do that? He will shake. See the word twice there, verse six and seven. God is saying he will act. He doesn't just make promises, he acts. He will act, he will do something. 
I take it that word shake just means he will do something so unmistakable in the eyes of the world to bring about his people knowing his glory. And because he does it, because he acts, his people, the end of verse 9, will know his peace. That's what God says he'll do to this people who are currently looking at a pile of rubble. And this is what he will do in the years to come. And of course, what does he want them to say? He wants them to, know, to say, if he was to walk around, why are you building? For them to say, because our God was going to fill this temple with glory. I don't know if you've ever had that experience of um, looking out over a mountain range. And you look out and you can, all you can see is peaks in the distance. The thing is, as you look at the peaks, they look wonderful but you just don't know the distance between the peaks. You know what I'm talking about? You just don't know the distance between the peaks. It's kind of like that with fulfillment when it comes to the Old Testament. Because this promise that God is saying that he will act to be with his people, it's got two peaks. And the thing is, we know one of them. So Jesus Christ, God's son, lived. He died on the cross. And what do the gospel writers record as having happened as he dies on the cross darkness unexplainable darkness falls over the land it's an unmistakable act what is happening is Jesus is bearing the full weight of God's anger against our sin on himself as he hangs on the cross it's an unmistakable act now what happens the camera pans to the temple what happens in the temple there was a huge curtain there this big no entry sign that says that Sinful mankind cannot enter the presence of a holy God, the very place where God lived. And what happens is Jesus dies. The camera pans to the temple and this curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. It's an unmistakable act. And you can know peace with God. You can know access to this God. You can know him as your father because of the crucified Christ. And if you're here today and you haven't put your faith in this Jesus, you need to know that this is what you're turning down. This is what's an offer. Peace with the God of the universe. We are justified. We are right with him because of who Jesus is. And on the third day, Jesus rises. What is it? What do the gospel writers recall? They recall a violent earthquake. God literally shook the world at the resurrection of Jesus. It is an un mistakable sign God has acted in the crucified and in the risen Christ that's one mountain peak second mountain peak still to come when this Jesus returns and there is a great trumpet call I take it that just means there's another shaking unmistakable as he ushers in the new heavens and the new earth, this kingdom of peace. Now, it's a kingdom of peace because there is no more death. There is no more tears. There is no more sadness. There is no mourning because there is no sin, because God has defeated his enemies. And for Christians, we understand that Jesus has paid for our sin on the cross. This is not about being a Christian, being a perfect person. This is about trusting yourself to Jesus who died for you. But if your hope isn't in Jesus, friends, this peace should come as a loving warning from heaven that either Jesus is paying for our sins or we're paying for our sins. And if our trust isn't in Jesus, then there is the thought of facing the almighty God eternally having to be punished for our sins. Stuart was saying it earlier, we love people enough that we want to tell them about that. But this is where history is, glorious go is gloriously going. And so God says to this people, do not fret over the rubble. Keep building, keep building based on what I say will happen in the future. Let me just tell you one of the, my favorite stories that Jesus tells in the Gospels. And it's this parable of the mustard seed, right? And he tells it to his disciples who are facing up to the reality 
of what it is to follow him. And they're just watching this happen. They're, they're thinking to themselves, why are the religious leaders in the Gospels not interested in Jesus? Why are the crowds disappearing? Grappling with the unimpressive nature of following Jesus. And Jesus takes them aside and he says, the kingdom of God is like dot, dot, dot. You get this in Matthew 13. I think, top of my head. The kingdom of God is like, don't you ever played this game? I often play it in the Gospels. I don't know whether it's good. But it's called, if I were Jesus, how would I finish the sentence? I'm speaking to my followers. And I'm saying the kingdom of God is like, I want to encourage them in the journey. What am I saying? I would have gone for, for, gone for something like, the kingdom of God is like Kilimanjaro. Looks huge. It's impressive. It's massive. Or I would have gone like something, the kingdom of God is like uh, an impressive yacht in Monte Carlo. So I would have gone for. Impressive. Grand. I know the world can't see it, but it's grand. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like, it's like a mustard seed. Next time you're in Dobby's, have a look for one. The smallest seed that you can imagine. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like that. But when that mustard seed goes to the ground and dies, and it begins to grow, over time at the end of the day, that is growing into the largest of garden trees. And what looks to you like the kingdom of God looks unimpressive now, but it will be anything other than unimpressive on the final day. Here is the mustard-shaped king calling his people to adopt a mustard, uh, mustard seed life, all because they have been captured by a mustard seed vision of the future. Your life feels messy now. Your life feels unimpressive now. Absolutely, so did Jesus's. As he dies on the cross, that looked anything other than impressive. And yet, what would he say? Mustard seed kingdom. Working away, buying into God's plan for the future. Not being discouraged by how things look now, but buying into this glorious vision as God says, I will fill the temple with glory. And just as we close, let me tell you about an older lady I visited recently. An older couple. Finding it more physically difficult to get out on a Sunday. And I'm sure that they could have easily tapped out the present. And as well, because I recognize the church will have changed a lot in their time here. Particularly, I'm sure as they come back, they will look out. And many of you will not have seen them before. All these new faces. But let me tell you, when I visited them, what encouraged me massively. What they did is that they told me they very much have a heart to be involved in the present. They can't physically be here as much as possible as they want, but they want to be here spiritually speaking. Do you know how they do it? They go in, they bring it out, they keep a scrapbook, right? They keep a scrapbook. And it's a prayer scrapbook. What they do, every month we produce a newsletter. They get the newsletter. Any new members, cut them out into the scrapbook. So if you've been a member here in the last two years, three years, your picture's been in there, you're in the scrapbook, right? New member, scrapbook. Prayer request, scrapbook. Mission report, scrapbook. Anything else going on, scrapbook. So they have this scrapbook at home, and they just pray. They just pray. Can't physically be here. They want to still be involved. They want to still be active with what God is doing in our nation, all in the scrapbook. It's amazing. Scrapbook. In the scrapbook. And I'm driving home and reflecting on it, picturing them, praying, at their age, in the room, thinking, that is the mustard-shaped life. Right there. Anything other than impressive. Anything other than impressive. But what is it that keeps them going? What is it that keeps them wanting to be involved in the present? Because they understand the future. They understand the future. The mustard-shaped life. Knowing the best is yet to come. So here are these people, Haggai's generation, looking at a pile of rubble, thinking about giving up. And God says, keep going because of what I'm doing in the future. Keep going. It'll blow you away what I'm going to do. 
God says to our generation today, making disciples, keeping on speaking for Jesus, seeking first the kingdom of God, keep going. Why? Because Jesus is with you. Keep going because of the future. And so here's what I want you to do today. If you're weary and you're tired and you're spent and you're discouraged, come and drink in these precious promises from God your Father. And here's what we're going to do. We're just going to be silent for a moment. And I want us all to do that. And just bring him our requests. And let's pray that God by his spirit would take these promises and would they be furnace, uh, fi- um, fuel for the furnace of our hearts. That's what I'm saying. Let's pray, shall we? It is grace that has brought us safe thus far and it is grace that will see us home. And we just thank you, Father, for who you are today. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Oh, Father, help us with the eye of faith to keep on doing what you've called us to do. Father, furnace the fire of our hearts with a burning desire to serve you in this nation. Father, for those who are discouraged today, I pray that you would draw alongside. Father, for those who are hurting today, Lord, would you be the God of all comfort to them? Lord, those who are struggling with sin, would you bring a fresh understanding through your indwelling Holy Spirit of just who Jesus is, what he's done for us on the cross, and the fact that in him, you will get us home. So Father, we praise you for who you are today. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're just going to close our service by singing this wonderful old hymn called Amazing Grace. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So let's sing this in faith with gusto, and then Alistair will come back and close our service.
being with us today whether that's in the building or online let us leave with these words in our mind that point us forward to that glorious day when we will be united with Christ in the glory of God forever Jude says this to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Savior be glory majesty power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore.